Hi, I'm uh, Ray Nan. I'm a member of the Orange County uh, chapter. I'm here to introduce Judge Thapar. Judge Amol Thapar is a judge on the United States Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals. Before serving on the Sixth Circuit, he served on the United States District Court. Before becoming a judge, Judge Thapar served as United States Attorney for the Eastern District of Kentucky, and he has also worked for the law firms of Williams and Conley and Squire Sanders and Dempsey. Uh, judge Thapar began his career serving as a law clerk for the Honorable Arthur Spiegel on the Southern District of Ohio and Nathaniel R. Jones for the Sixth Circuit. Judge Thapar received his JD from Berkeley Law and his uh, bachelor's from Boston College. Thank you, Ray. Well, thank you very much for coming out to such a fabulous conference in an even as good a location. I'm honored to be here at the Reagan Library and how appropriate that we're talking about originalism during this panel at the Reagan Library. After all, when you think about originalism and its resurgence, you, Ronald Reagan should come immediately to mind. Ed Meese, Robert Bork, Justice Scalia, all the product of the greatest president maybe of all time, and at least in my mind, one of the greatest of all time. And it is great that we're here talking about one of my favorite subjects, the Anti-Federalists. For too long, when looking to the founding era history to understand the original public meaning of the Constitution, we've only paid attention to half of the debate. For all the lawyers in the audience, that would be like us judges reading only the respondent's brief and deciding a case. Now maybe that is because there's no Broadway musical about, about the anti-federalists. <laughs> we should work on that. Especially because, as John Baker will tell you shortly, Hamilton was responding to the anti-federalists and they didn't even get a cameo in his musical. <laughs> but maybe, just maybe, the reason we overlook the Anti-Federalists is because we have been a bit short-sighted. To properly understand the Constitution, you have to understand both sides of the debate. This panel is titled The Anti-Federalists and Theories of Originalism. You may be wondering, if the Anti-Federalists had much to say about originalism. They did. Indeed, the Anti-Federalists were basically the original originalists, despite what you hear from Professor Baker. <laughs> Specifically, Brutus, in Brutus 11, laid out what we know today as or original public meaning originalism. For those wondering, we think Brutus was a prominent founding fi era figure named Robert Yates. He was a New York Supreme Court judge and politician. He also went to the convention with Alexander Hamilton with the understanding that the charge of the convention was to amend the Articles of Confederation, not write a whole new constitution. Since Yates believed doing so was beyond their authority, he packed up his bags and went home. So back to Brutus and what he said about originalism. In one of his most important papers, he offered an early take on original public meaning originalism. He explained, and I'm quoting now and I want you to listen closely, according to this mode of construction, the courts are to give such meaning to the Constitution as comports best with the common and generally received acceptation of the words in which it is expressed regarding their ordinary and popular use rather than their grammatical propriety. Where words are dubious, they will be explained by the context. Again, that's Brutus 11. Now notice how close Brutus' words are to how we describe original public meaning today. Indeed, the Anti-Federalists talked of originalism using language that seems might quite modern. 
skipping over original intention originalism and other variations that led us where we are today. My theory on that, which hopefully we will address today, is because they believed in a government by the people and for the people. They wanted the law to be in a language everyday people could understand. After all, the Constitution was enacted by we the people, not we the delegates, or as the Anti-Federalists sometimes complained, by we the states. It even sounds like Ronald Reagan, who like the Anti-Federalists, feared big government and feared runaway judges. If I didn't tell you who said the earlier quote, you might think it was the late Justice Scalia. Justice Scalia defined originalism as follows, and I'm quoting, originalism gives to those terms the meaning they were understood to have when the people adopted them. Sounds a lot like Brutus. And now, how about another quotation? Lest we think the Anti-Federalists were alone in their views, when Hamilton finally started taking his meds, he said in a letter in 1791, whatever may have been the intention of the framers of the Constitution or of a law, that intention is to be sought for in the instrument itself, according to the usual and established rules of construction. The Anti-Federalists, like Justice Scalia, worried that without originalism, judges would substitute their own view for that of the people. And in doing so, Brutus was specifically worried that judges would aggrandize their power at the expense of the people. Brutus warned that when judges don't stick to the original public meaning and instead follow the spirit of the Constitution, they will be motivated to aggrandize power to themselves and consequently expand the power of the federal government. Sound familiar? Ultimately, Brutus warned, in short, and I'm quoting again, judges are independent of the people, of the legislature, and of every power under heaven. Men placed in this situation, and now women, will generally soon feel themselves independent of heaven itself. Did his warnings come true? As judges abandon the words and concepts of the Constitution and substitute the fads of the day, we become much more like kings and much less like judges. This is exactly what Brutus feared and Justice Scalia did too. In a minute, Professor Baker's gonna tell you why I'm wrong, or at least why the Anti-Federalists listened to Brutus, or at least agreed with him. So I'm gonna introduce Professor Baker first. He's a teacher of the world. If you don't believe me, he has been a visiting professor of, at the University of Lyon in France, at the University de los Andes in Chile, where he was a Fulbright specialist in 2012, he has lectured at universities and research institutions in Argentina, Austria, Brazil, China, Croatia, Peru, Slovenia, Taiwan, Vietnam, and Philippines, to name a few. He also teaches at Georgetown and technically, I think, is still a professor at LSU, correct? Emeritus. Emeritus. He received his JD with honors from the University of Michigan Law School, luckily after that experience, he went to the University of Dallas to fix his thinking <laughs> and graduated magna cum laude. He's also earned a PhD in political thought from the University of London. That's why he's a big fan of the Federalists and doesn't pay attention to the Anti-Federalists. Uh, most importantly, he's a very good friend of mine, and maybe even more importantly, he used to teach separation of powers with Justice Scalia. In short, if you don't know John, you should probably turn in your Federalist Society membership at the door. All right, John. That's the best reception any judge has ever given me. <laughs> you should disclose we teach together. 
You might have detected that Judge Sapir is not a fan of Hamilton's. But being the fair-minded judge that he is, he made sure that I was here to present the opposite case. And it's not really that opposite. There's a lot of what uh, the anti-federalist said, we say, has come true. But it is not necessary to make the jump that somehow the founding by the Federalist was wrong. They're both founders, but the Federalists framed the Constitution. And originalism is not a theory. Originalism is what the oath judges take binds them to do. And unfortunately, it has not really been possible to get senators on the Judiciary Committee to really hone in on nominees and ask them about the seriousness of the oath that they're about to take. Anyway, in order to really get into this, it's more complicated than just the Federalist versus the Anti-Federalist. But what that debate does is to bring to our attention that the Republic was founded on and assumes a continued, lively public debate, which is almost impossible given television, radio, cable news, talk shows, and what has happened in Washington. It is certainly the most divisive in Washington that I've ever seen it, and that's been for a while. So I want to cover three points. One, to get into this, we have to understand how we got into it. And as often is the case, conservatives use terminology without understanding that they're buying into the progressive agenda without really knowing it. So first of all, I want to talk about the constitutional justification of the court's power to review for constitutionality statutes. Two, I want to talk about the judicial power in the context of separation of powers, because that's where it arises. And three, this is the most important part probably, the reason why Brutus's prediction came true is what the progressives have done, and many who call themselves conservatives have unwittingly bought into it. That has changed the structure as it was laid down and has modified things that have allowed this prediction to come true. So first of all, on justification, back before the Federalist Society, I remember watching an American Bar Association video on the origin of judicial review, as they called it. And so they had this actor as John Marshall, and they were seated at the conference table considering the case of Marbury. And all of a sudden, he gets up from his chair, and he's thinking like this, and he goes to the bookshelf, and he points, and he pulls it down, and he says, ah, the rule of law. <laughs> that, they did that. With that came the notion propagated throughout law schools that Marbury versus Madison was made up, that the power of the judiciary was made up. Well, if that's true, then the fight becomes between are you half pregnant or fully pregnant? That is between restraint and pure doing what you want to do. How did that happen? Well, like most bad things, it happened at Harvard Law School. Where else? <laughs> so you may have heard about James Thayer and his famous article, probably the most famous on constitutional law. Indeed, he invented, in a way, the field of constitutional law, at least among judges. And he gave the theory of restraint, which many conservatives have bought into. Restraint is not the issue. Nor is activism the issue. The issue is the text. At some points you're supposed to restrain, at other points you're not. That's the issue. But unfortunately, and even I picked up an article from Heritage from about four years ago, and it said, no, restraint is not progressive. Yes, it is. It is the theory that was propagated in law schools 
up until the Vietnam War, when they decided they wanted to discover natural rights and natural law for certain purposes. Not for all purposes, certain purposes. Didn't apply to property, applied to other things. That was the great judges, many conservatives like Holmes. If you like Holmes, you are not an originalist, okay? He was not an originalist. In order to understand originalism, you have to understand what the Federalists described, what they were doing with the text of the Constitution. And it is not that you go to the Federalists as opposed to the text, it is because you can't understand the text as it relates in, among the parts in some senses that you have to understand what they were doing. So for instance, we say we're textualist originalists. Okay, where does the term separation of powers appear in the Constitution? As Justice Scalia would say, in each one of the articles, the beginning, all legislative power, et cetera. No, they didn't spell out the term. Why? Because they wanted ordinary people to understand it. Why? Because they didn't want lawyers monkeying around with it. Why? Because there were different theories of separation of powers. They wanted it very specific but it's like the difference between the building and the blueprint for the building. You may admire this building, but if you really want to know how it was built, you better look at the blueprint. The Federalist Papers are the blueprint. And it's a guidance because many of the issues that come up can be uh, easily misinterpreted. So for instance, I didn't use the term judicial review until I talked about the ABA. The term judicial review is a 20th century invention. That shapes our thinking. We shouldn't use that term. I know, it's impossible not to use the term. But when we use terminologies that are invented by the progressives, we automatically are accepting premises. And anybody who understands argument knows that Argument is based, as Aristotle says, on unstated premises. And when you accept the premises of the other side, you're on your way to losing. And originalists have won on many battles, but ultimately we're not winning on originalism because of the other dimensions that are involved in all of this. So take Marbury. As Scalia said, Justice Scalia, excuse me. As Justice Scalia would say, Marshall merely plagiarized from Federalist 78. Now, he didn't cite the Federalist. Well, why didn't he? For the same reason you mentioned. It's supposed to be plain. Well, what about those conservatives who say, well, nowhere in the Constitution does it say anything about judicial review? Okay. But Brutus, he found it. You didn't quote him on that one. He found it, he pointed it out. This court is going to enforce the Constitution as a supreme law. They're gonna have the last word. They're gonna be superior to the Congress. He understood if he could see it, why can't we see it? So, the judicial power. When you look at Federalist 78, which Members of the Federalist Society are fond of quoting. Unfortunately, they don't read far enough sometimes. So for instance, when the discussion comes up after the discussion about independent judges, and by the way, do not confuse, as the American Bar Association always does, or conflates, independence of judges with the power of judicial review. They are not the same. British judges who had no power of judicial review we're independent. Independence, we know, only means tenure during, during good behavior and non-diminishable salary. But if you conflate, conflate the two, the argument is, well, you're interfering with the in, independence of the judiciary. You're not, as long as you leave their salary alone and as long as you don't impeach them on frivolous grounds. What does it say here, though, after the force or will? So, in Federalist 78, the judiciary, on the contrary, has no influence over the sword or the purse, no direction 
either the strength or of the wealth of the country and can have no active resolution whatever, it may only, it may truly be said to have neither force nor will. And the stop. But here's the most important part. But, but merely judgment and must ultimately depend upon the aid of the executive arm, even for the efficacy of its judgments. Jefferson thought that you couldn't control the judiciary because the impeachment was a scarecrow, he said, when he couldn't get uh, the first impeachment of a judge through conviction. Impeachment was never intended to be easy. That's why it was split between the House and the Senate. The key was executive enforcement. Remember, until the legal realists, judges did not say that they made law. That's an invention by Holmes following the British positivist Austin. Marshall and Story would say, specifically in Swift, Story said, judges' opinions are not law. Why do we call them opinions? They're opinions. That doesn't mean they're not authoritative. But as Lincoln said, we have to respect the judgment in Dred Scott. We do not have to respect the precedent. The reason why we normally respect precedents is like the common law. When a series of precedents are laid down and they become accepted, they're accepted as custom. But some precedents that go beyond and are not accepted by ordinary people, they do not have the authority that would otherwise attach to a series of precedents. We've lost that whole idea. It was explained in de Tocqueville. He explained, and Justice Scalia would often quote this, that what judges did was they would simply ignore the law, the statute. And once it was ignored enough, it was a dead letter. That's how things were in the 19th century until Dred Scott. And then the South started proclaiming what became judicial supremacy. You can't question what the court did. It is pronounced. That attitude is much the attitude of many progressives today, or at least before the Trump judges were appointed. <laughs> anyway. So. How do we get here? Well, first of all, I don't care whether you're talking about anti-federalists or federalists. If they would come back here today and walk into and see what federal courts are doing, they would say, these are not courts. Think about it. There was a big dispute at the beginning between equity jurisdiction and common law jurisdiction. Why? Because equity can only be the exception to the rule. When equity becomes the rule, you destroy the law. It goes back to Greek philosophy. What did the federal rules of civil procedure do? It joined law and equity. Are the equitable remedies in constitutional litigation exceptional anymore? Is it that tough to get an injunction? How often? There should be no surprise about nationwide injunctions. It's the next logical step. What courts got into in terms of administering prisons, administering all kinds of state institutions, courts never did that. Injunctions went for a period of time. They didn't go on for 40 years as some of the DSEG cases went on for. These are not courts, but there are other non-courts. Tax court is not a court. It's an administrative agency. How about FISA? The fact that you put three judges on something that are Article Three does that make it a court if it doesn't do what a court does? No. It's not that different from the panel of judges that Justice Scalia excoriated in uh, Morrison v. Olson, he used to call it 
a pickup group of three judges. What did they do? Did they, did they hear cases? No, they appointed independent prosecutors and regulated them. Regulated? What's that? That's an administrative agency. How about the Sentencing Commission? We've got judges doing things that the founders never thought they should do. How did that happen? It's part and parcel of the administrative state. How did that happen? The 17th Amendment. Once the Senate ceased to protect the states, it was all over. It is the very concentration of power that the anti-federals and the federalists were opposed to. If you want originalism, you have to take it all. You can't just be judicial restrainers. That's not enough. It doesn't work that way. In fact, it doesn't work that way, and it destroys the rule of law. Justice Holmes, who's not a favorite of mine, he said that it really wouldn't be that bad if we didn't have judicial review over the other two branches of the federal government. But it would be terrible if we didn't have judicial review over the states. That is a prescription for consolidation of power. Because separation of powers for which the judiciary is very important is what all of the framers, founders, both Federalist and Anti-Federalist agreed on. As said in Federalist 47, there can be no liberty if those three are not separated. And in 78, there can be no liberty if two of them are joined. The administrative state is essentially the joinder of Congress and at least parts of the judiciary. Congress treats the judiciary as another administrative agency for it to palm off things on. It allows them to pass ambiguous, broad statutes that they turn over to the administrative state and the courts have for so long been unwilling to do their job and say that what the Congress has done in so many instances goes well beyond any of its powers. Thank you very much. I'm glad that uh, Professor Baker, I should call him, finally sounds like an anti-federalist. We've been debating this for so long. Um, he also forgot to mention that Justice Scalia affectionately referred to the Sentencing Commission as the Junior Varsity Congress. <laughs> so it's my pleasure to in introduce Professor Green. Professor Chris Green is the HLA Hart Scholar of Law and Philosophy and has taught at the University of Mississippi in God's country since 2006. He is the author of Equal Citizenship, Civil Rights, and the Constitution, The Original Sense of the Privileges or Immunities Clause. He went to Princeton and then Yale for law school, and most importantly, he went to Notre Dame to get his PhD in philosophy and undo the damage that the other schools did. <laughs> Luckily, they did so, and we now have a great professor at the University of Mississippi. He also clerked on the Fifth Circuit for Judge Barksdale. Judge Oldham wasn't there to clerk for at the time, otherwise I'm sure he would have applied to Judge Oldham. So it's my great pleasure to in introduce Professor Green. And Professor Green, actually, hopefully most of you have. Do you all have this handout? Excellent. So he did some work, and hopefully this will help you all as you go through his talk. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, Judge Thapar and I did not uh, coordinate uh, even in the slightest bit, uh, but it uh, turns out the bit from Brutus 11 uh, that he quoted is on the handout. Uh, so if you want to get some context for that, uh, and you don't have uh, an internet connection to uh, dial up uh, volume 15 of the documentary history of the ratification of the Constitution, um, pages 513 to 14, uh, uh, you, can, you can look at that. But um, so I'm on the way out the door, uh, and uh, my 13-year-old uh, says, wait, no, no wait, wait a minute, you're, 
you're going to the to the federal. It said basically what what, what Lisa uh, uh, pointed out. You know, you're going to the Federalist Society to talk about the Anti-Federalists, and you know, we, uh, uh, I've, you know, you're wearing your We the People tie. You know, it's got all these these signatures. You know, you know. Randolph didn't sign it, and George Mason didn't sign it, and Elbridge Gary didn't sign it. Uh, no, she, she's not old enough to know that about the Gary thing. She, Elbridge Gary, you know, she, she, she thinks, uh, she's heard gerrymandering so many times, she mispronounces his name. So, um, so one question is, how is this even a question? Were the anti-federalists uh, originalist? Uh, were they textualist? To be an originalist, you might think, requires you to uh, be committed to the Constitution and then be wondering, how do I interpret the thing? Okay, how can you oppose the Constitution and yet have a theory about how the Constitution should be interpreted? Isn't interpretive theory a normative enterprise um, that is a, a, a branch of practical reasoning? What should we do? Uh, well, it's not, um, as I see it. Uh, what is it a branch of? Well, uh, as I see the, the, the task of constitutional theory, the first thing we're supposed to do is figure out what the Constitution is. So we've got this term, the Constitution. Okay, well, we make claims, the Constitution forbids something, the Constitution allows something. Uh, what is the truth maker for that claim? What's the thing out there? in history or wherever, you know, the platonic realm uh, that re makes those sorts of claims, renders those sorts of claims true or false. So Alfred Tarski has a, a thing called the semantic conception of truth, a semantic uh, a theory of truth. Uh, don't worry, uh, this won't be on the exam. Uh, it's on the, ex I always tell my students, it's on the exam of life. Uh, uh, so. You've got a term and then, you know, is there a thing out there that the, that the term picks out, okay? The anti-federalists, when they use the term, the Constitution, they're referring to a thing, okay? And they really are referring to the same thing, I think, that the federalists were. They have a common object. You've gotta have a common object if you're actually going to have a fight, an actual disagreement. So if the anti-federalists think the Constitution is one thing and the federalists think it's something else, and they, the federalists say yay for X, and the anti-federalists say boo for Y, well, that, that's not actually a disagreement. You have to have a common object, and top, common interpretive object, in order to have a disagreement. So uh, the anti-federalists, I think, provide a lot of very important confirmatory material about what it was uh, that they wanted the nation to say no to. They wanted the nation to say no to a historically situated textual expression of meaning. Okay, so I think uh, it's pretty clear uh, from the stuff I've been able to, to look over uh, that they were both originalists. They thought the Constitution, which is to say the constitutional truth maker, was situated temporally at the founding, it wasn't intergenerational. Things don't become constitutional based on intergenerational continuing authorship over time. It's at the founding that the, the, the text expresses something, and it's a text. It's words that express meaning. It's not uh, goals. It's not expected application. It's the text. Okay, so how do I, how do I show this? Um, um, I don't have time. Uh, uh, we we uh, said we'd limit ourselves to just a few minutes, uh, but you got the handout. So even if I uh, uh, pass out or I uh, uh, get even more incoherent, at least you know you'll have uh, you know somewhat more coherent green at the keyboard this week uh, uh, to, to to fall back on. Um, Brutus is great. Uh, I mean, really, I I wholeheartedly concur with. Uh, 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 Mike Rappaport's uh, assessment that he is uh, a, a, a wonderfully fine mind. Um, John DeWitt, he's a Massachusetts guy. I really like him quite a lot. Um, so, um, so I mean, listen to this. I, 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 when I, when I, I was just you know rereading all these anti-federalists and then you know sort of thinking about constitutional theory all the time. When I read this, I, I, I jumped up and I, I read it to my to my uh, assembled uh, family, um, and uh, my 13-year-old uh, uh, Hadley said, uh, 
oh, my goodness, that sounds just like you, Daddy. Uh, but, uh, but listen to this. Uh, uh, so this is uh, uh, John DeWitt. All contracts, this is, uh, so this is November 1787. It's not quite, so he's responding clearly to James Wilson. James Wilson is kind of first out of the box in terms of the debate. And, you know, people get the thing September 17th and, you know, days after, they're like, uh, no, Bill of Rights, what's the deal with that? And then James Wilson says, oh, 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 a Bill of Rights would have been a bad thing because y'all would have been super confused about, you know, too much power if you, you would have made a misinference about, about the existence of Bill of Rights. So DeWitt, you know, says, well, come on, we wouldn't have been that confused. We know how language works. Uh, we know how interpretation works. Um, but here's one of the things he said about how language works. All contracts are to be construed according to the meaning of the parties at the time of making them. And then the next few sentences, I think he's uh, tying into an anti-mental reservationist moral tradition. Pascal in 1656, if you're into that, which probably not, but uh, 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 you know, by which is meant that mutual communication shall take place and shall each shall explain to the other their ideas of the contract before them if any unfair practices are made use of, if its real tendency is concealed by either party or any advantage taken in the execution of it, it is in itself fraudulent and may be avoided. So you've got to express your intention in the text. You can't have secret mental reservations going through your head that you know, are really, really what's binding. Um, um, and then, uh, uh, you know, so he's talking about how these are contracts are interpreted. There is no difference in the constitution of government. Um, so DeWitt, Brutus, I mean, a bunch of these guys talk about explicitly about rules of interpretation. Um, so, we, so when Wilson says, oh, you'd get confused if we had a Bill of Rights, he said, DeWitt says exactly rightly, no, we have ways of communicating, we have uh, conventions of, of speech uh, uh, that we have, and we understand them in America. So the doctrine uh, that, we, that we don't need a Bill of Rights is poorly calculated for the meridian of America, where the nature of compact, the mode of construing them, and the principles upon which society is founded are so accurately known and universally uh, diffused. Uh, so I think this gives uh, confirmation to a lot of the stuff that um, uh, Mike Rappaport and uh, John McGinnis have done about original methods of interpretation. You know, were there any actual interpretive uh, conventions at the time of the founding? They certainly thought there were, okay? And really, there's a lot of overlap uh, uh, between the Anti-Federalists and the Federalists. So one thing, you look at these debates, you think, oh, you know, it's this titanic debate, so much confusion, nobody agrees about anything. When you look at the details, there's a lot of agreement. So you look at Helvidius and Pacificus in 1793 and 94, Madison and Hamilton agree about a lot about executive power and uh, uh, legislative power with respect to foreign policy. You know, you look at the, the, uh, the second uh, uh, cabinet meeting rap battle in Hamilton, you think, oh my goodness, this Titanic uh, you know, difference. Uh, Jackson in, in his Youngstown concurrence says, oh, I, I don't know what this means. It's like skinny cows eating fat cows. What, you know, what could it possibly mean? But if you actually st sit down and look at Helvetus and Pacificus, they overlap on quite a lot. Uh, and I think similarly, if you look at what the Federalists and Federalists say about uh, uh, the nature of the Constitution, they really do agree on a lot. 1862, the debate about due process during the Civil War, really we have a bipartisan uh, uh, due process clause. Uh, there's a massive amount of, of convergence on that. Massive amount of convergence today, really. You think, oh my goodness, we disagree about everything. We agree about this fact, that we have the oldest operative Constitution in the world. Uh, when we swear an oath, you, you, you pull up the congressional record and, you know, control F oath, you're going to find a lot of these uh, today, this week, uh, obviously. Uh, 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 and they say they, take, they swear the same oath that George Washington swore to the same Constitution. So you really do find a lot of, a lot of agreement. Couple points, uh, just very quickly, about the nature of, of, of the debate between the Anti-Federalists and the Federalists that I think really shows that both of the uh, uh, textualism and originalism when the Anti-Federalists complain about ambiguity, so they say, this text is unclear. Then the Federalists come back and they say, oh, it's not unclear. Here's what it means. Frequently you get this response from the Anti-Federalists. Well, uh, what you said is clear, maybe. And that's one way to interpret the text. But what you're saying about the text is not the same as what the text is. 
They insist on the ambiguity of the text continuing to be a problem, even after the Federalists have given their explanation. So the textualism uh, really comes out in those sorts of exchanges. Secondly, uh, the permanence of the Constitution is very clear uh, uh, when they, they're just, they see the stakes of the situation in ratification. So when Patrick Henry is talking about uh, uh, what, would, what will happen if we ratify the Constitution, he's not thinking, oh, well, you know, next year we'll it'll just sort of be a common law continuing evolution. We can, you know, just continue to, to author it a little bit more. No, I mean, it's going to be permanent. And I think, you know, Article 6 and Article 7 uh, and the preamble, I mean, it's made clear. It's, it's, it's one generation authoring a particular thing which is going to be binding uh, over time. And Henry recognized that. Uh, and he, he thought it was a bad thing to do, but both he and the, and the, uh, the, the Federalists indig- uh, indicated it was, it was mining. So uh, a bunch of, a bunch of uh, uh, squibs there, um, other stuff that I could talk about. Uh, it's written on paper. DeWitt says that. You know, the, the Constitution is a recital upon paper. It's textualism. Elbridge Gerry says, you know, I'm enclosing the Constitution. It's clearly text. It's not uh, purposes or, uh, or applications, and it's, it's clearly temporally uh, situated at the founding. So that's it. Thank you. Finally, it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Bomsai. He uh, is a professor at UVA, uh, went to Yale for undergrad and Chicago for law school. He clerked in the best circuit in the country, the Sixth Circuit, for Jeff Sutton and then for Justice Scalia. After clerking, uh, he worked at OLC. So I got to have an aside to his bio, which is a cool fact about Professor Bomsai. And it fits into what Professor Baker was saying today. He was talking about the tax court, but I think he would say the same thing about the Court of Appeals for the Armed Forces, or at least I imagine you would. And Professor Bomsai filed a brief, an amicus brief, in the Supreme Court, and I want to quote from it. He said, Chief Justice Marshall's opinion in Marbury v. Madison makes it clear that the Supreme Court cannot exercise appellate jurisdiction under Article III directly from an officer of the executive branch. Accordingly, the Supreme Court's exercise over of jurisdiction over cases directly from the Court of Appeals of the Armed Forces violates Article 3. And in a very unusual step, the Supreme Court granted him 10 minutes of argument time. I think it was it 10 days before argument? Something like that. Something like that. And it's almost never, I don't know when the last time it's been done, other than for the SG, have they ever done it for non-parties before? Uh, for big institutional parties, like the Chamber of Commerce, but I'm not sure, you know, some random professor at the university yeah, that's right. is able to file. Right. He's no longer random. So uh, the final part of the introduction is he's not some random professor at the University <laughs> of Virginia, but a rising superstar. And so it's my pleasure to introduce my friend, Professor Bonza. Thanks, Judge. Um, it's a very kind introduction, and uh, thanks for having me here. Um, so I thought uh, when I was preparing my remarks for uh, this event that I would uh, focus on a theme, and my theme is going to be two and a half chairs for exploring and using the anti-federalists. So we'll get the, to the two and then the half. And the way in which um, I, I'm going to approach this issue is I'm going to kind of think of the ways in which uh, anti-federalists, um, they, they can help everyday lawyers. Um, and in a way, perhaps my remarks bridge the gap between this panel, the next panel, it's going to be about the anti-federalist papers and the courts. Um, so uh, well, let me just get right into the different uh, chairs. The first one is a full chair, and that is that um, you know all, um, all all theories of constitutional interpretation, in some sense, and originalism particularly, um, claim to start with the text of the Constitution and then try to place the terms of the Constitution in context to figure out what they can fairly mean, what they fairly mean. And um, and the first uh, cheer that I have is that um, we have a tool that we try, we will often use to try to do this, um, which are Madison's notes at the uh, Constitutional Convention. 
And the anti-federalists can, in interesting ways, confirm or contradict what happened uh, and what we see from the notes at the Constitutional Convention. Um, so just you know, a word about Madison's notes. If you look at recent Supreme Court cases, they'll often cite the notes in order to um, uh, uh, understand the meaning of the Constitution. They'll, they'll use, perhaps you're familiar with this, famous edition by Max Ferrand in 1911. And so if you were just to do a word search for Ferrand in Supreme Court opinions, um, I can rattle off a whole number of cases on different topics that rely on Ferran's edition of Madison's Notes. There's the Rucho case, which deals with partisan gerrymandering. There's the Tennessee Wine and Spirits case, application of the Dormant Commerce Clause, Kaiser versus Wilkie, interpretation of agency regulations, Lucia, a case about the constitutional status of administrative law judges, the Jesner case about the law of nations, and Patrick versus Zinke about uh, the authority of Congress to limit lower court jurisdiction. So these are just a whole bunch of cases in which we've seen the court rely on Madison's Notes. And one of the merits, you might say, of using these notes from the Federal Convention is that they show how the text of the Constitution has changed over time to accommodate various perspectives that members of the convention are putting forward. So it's very interesting because you try to glean from that, well, what do they actually mean, these terms, which can sometimes be pitched at a level of abstraction, actually mean? One of the downsides of using the notes, and this has been a criticism by scholars over the decades, is that um, they weren't themselves widely published and known about until 1840. So people um, up till that day don't actually read Madison's notes and make arguments based off of them. Um, and we can't know for sure, I, I guess, as a result of that, whether the changes that are made in the convention which are in some sense in secret, um, are in fact in the minds of members of the public more widely when they're debating and ultimately ratifying the Constitution. So you don't know whether this is some idiosyncratic debate that's occurring at the convention or something the public actually understands and thinks, yes, this is the salient point that we care about over here. Um, and I think that what's interesting is the documents from outside the convention then can either help us try to figure out whether these debates actually matter to the public or did not. And here are a couple of examples of that. Um, so one is a, the first one is a very well-known example, and that is that Madison, in his notes, he records a debate that occurs um, on September 14, 1787. Um, and for those of you who uh, remember the timeline of the debate, that's three days before the end of the convention. So three days before the end of the convention, there's a debate over whether the Constitution should give Congress the authority to charter corporations. And Madison is actually making the proposal. He says, quote, where the interests of the United States might require and the legislative provisions of individual states may be incompetent. Uh, and the immediate context of this proposal that Madison is making is a narrower proposal by Benjamin Franklin, who's saying, well, we should charter corporations to provide for cutting canals where deemed necessary. And then there's an objection to the proposal by uh, a delegate from Massachusetts who says that, well, the states will be prejudiced and divided into parties by it because in Philadelphia and New York, it'll be referred to as the establishment of a bank, which has been a subject of contention in those cities. And what ultimately happens is the delegates vote on a motion specifying, uh, which, is, which is limited to the case of canals, and then they reject that motion. Um, so that's what happens, but you, you may wonder, well, did people outside of the convention, because remember the proceedings are in secret, did they see the Constitution and wonder about corporations? And the answer to that is clearly yes, uh, and we know it to be yes, because just a few years later, when there's a controversy about chartering the First Bank of the United States, the participants in that debate are well aware of the debate that occurs during the convention. They refer to it. Um, and. Um, Thomas Jefferson, for example, writes a memorandum for, for the president, for George Washington at the time, and he says, well, it's, uh, this is a quote, it's known that the very power now proposed as a means to charter the first bank was rejected as an end by the convention which formed the Constitution. Alexander Hamilton, then the Secretary of the Treasury, he responds to Jefferson, and he argues that well, we, we can't tell from the debate at the convention what the precise nature ex or extent of the position was, um, and that is not ascertained by any authentic document or even by accurate recollection. Those are his words. Um, so ultimately, Washington signs the bill and the bank is chartered, um, but what I use this example to show is that um, it's a very common mode of argumentation to start with Madison's notes, which tell us something about the discussions at the convention, but then we have to confirm from other documents uh, and perhaps by other members of the public, whether they also believe these legal issues were salient rather than relying on just some sort of secret drafting history of the Constitution. Um, sometimes, though, you cannot find sources from 
uh, like Jefferson and Hamilton's memoranda that speak clearly to a constitutional issue. In, it's just not available in the uh, conventional um, sources. And sometimes the anti-federalist papers that can then be a source for the con confirmation of uh, a debate that occurred in that secret drafting history or is recorded in the secret drafting history. So a second debate um, that's less well known um, that illustrates this point is um, on the very same day that the chartering corporations debate is occurring, John Rutledge, who's a delegate from South Carolina, he's the chair of the Committee of Detail. Uh, he's future Chief Justice of the United States. He moves to strike out a provision that's in the then existing draft that authorizes Congress to appoint a, quote, treasurer by joint ballot. Um, that provision, uh, which may be surprising to some people in the audience, because remember, this is actually in the draft constitution three days before the convention ends. There's a provision that allows Congress to appoint by joint ballot a treasurer. Um, that provision would have come as no surprise whatsoever to the delegates at the convention, because many state constitutions of the era contain comparable provisions uh, that allow the legislature to appoint certain state officers who executed the law, such as the treasurer. Um, Rutledge, he argues, along with people like Governor Morris and Charles Pinckney, that authorizing the president rather than Congress to appoint the treasurer in the same manner that the president usually uh, appoints other officers of the United States would ensure that the treasurer was, quote, more narrowly watched and would avoid bad appointments. Other delegates, however, disagree, and they claim that presidential control of the treasurer would, quote, have a mischievous tendency and would, quote, multiply objections to the proposed constitution in part because Congress appropriates money and it is best for them to appoint the officer who's to keep it. It's kind of really interesting to me. I probably won't get into the details of this, but um, if you've been following the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau litigation, this is extremely closely connected to that. Um, and what happens at the convention is that by an eight to three vote, the states uh, vote for Rutledge's motion. They strike an independent congressionally appointed treasurer, uh, which reverses a result a few days um, earlier, a month earlier or so, um, which would have kept the provision in. There's an earlier six to four vote that keeps the provision in. Three days later, the convention closes. The document goes to the um, uh, states for ratification. And when I looked around, I wondered whether people outside the Constitution noticed this. And they reflected on whether the Constitution incorporated one model, which would have been an independently appointed treasurer, or another. And I wasn't able to find that from conventional sources. So I don't think it's discussed in the Federalist Papers, or at least not expressly. Um, but I did find evidence from a pseudonymous anti-Federalist author. Uh, this is the Federal Farmer. Uh, and uh, he uh, is... Uh, arguing in this paper that giving the appointment of a few great officers to the legislature, uh, and he says, quote, among them, the commissioners of the treasury, the comptroller of treasurer, master coiner, and some of the principal officers in the money department would be better than the constitution. This is my objection to the constitution, is that the president gets to appoint the treasurer, and he notes that the officers of the above description are appointed by the legislature in some of the states and in some not. Um, and what's, what's interesting is perhaps we'll get to, uh, this gets to a point that we talked about in the earlier panel, and perhaps uh, Judge Oldham will pick up on this point uh, when he talks about the, the anti-federalists and who they were. Um, Melanchthon Smith, who is assumed by some to be, believed to be the federal farmer, actually um, gets up in the New York Convention and proposes an amendment to the Constitution to appoint commissioners of the Treasury uh, and the Treasurer of the United States. So it seems as though Melanchthon Smith is making the same proposal as the federal farmer whose pseudonymous is making in his paper. And the point I take it, um, I, at least to me, is that what's interesting is Madison's notes suggest that people who are writing the Constitution are aware that there are two different models that can be adopted for how to structure a Treasury Department. They seem to pick one, but you, you don't see that on the face of the document. Nobody knows Madison's notes at the time. Um, it's only uh, through reading um, Melanchthon Smith uh, that we can figure out that, oh yeah, people noticed. People looked at the document and they said, they, they have not set up a system by which there's an independent treasurer. Um, and in fact, that's different from the way in which we do things in many states. So I think this is one way in which I have a cheer for the anti-federalist papers, and that is that it will illustrate to us when debates were salient um, in ways that either confirm or can conceivably deny what happened at the uh, Constitutional Convention, uh, at least according to, to Madison's notes. So um, 
Uh, I, I see that we're running close to the time, Judge the Parvet. Should I continue with the second chair at least? Yeah. And then I'll get to the half chair. Okay. Let's get the second chair in. Okay. All right. So um, the second chair is that. Um, I don't want the half chair. We'll make it to the half chair. It's well known that if you have, if you're a partisan for a particular position, uh, and this could be for people who were in support of a constitution, um, you can oversell or undersell the consequences of the document based on perhaps your own personal views or uh, current expediency. So you know, sell short some of what the constitution might allow a federal government to do because you want people to ratify it, um, and trying to convince others that the Constitution was a good document that would lead to good results, it's entirely possible that the Federalists downplayed aspects of the Constitution they believed would be controversial, or it's even possible that they made mistakes about the meaning of the document due to sheer human error. Um, and I do have an example in mind of this phenomenon, but we can return to that in the Q&A if, in fact, people are interested. Um, the Anti-Federalists can provide a useful check on this problem because by providing the perspective of opponents, the anti-federalists can help us see where perhaps the proponents of adopting the Constitution oversold or undersold its provisions. Um, finally, so th that's my second chair, which is that it's a good check on what the proponents' views would be um, in terms of constitutional interpretation. Um, so I have a half a chair, and the half a chair is as follows. Um, I think looking at the anti-federalists can interestingly expand the universe of voices that we consider from around the time period of the Constitution's adoption. And I do think, uh, you know, when we hear from Judge Oldham uh, during the lunchtime presentation, he'll show that there, there are anti-federalists that brought distinct and diverse perspectives on the question of constitutional interpretation. Um, there is a caveat to that, which is that when we expand the universe of voices and perspectives, uh, we in all likelihood will also expand the universe of perspectives that might interpret the Constitution incorrectly. And there's a very human tendency to look at all these perspectives and pick out the one that you find that tends to support your own policy uh, perspectives. And so I think the half cheer is that with the benefit of greater diversity of voices, we also have to be careful not to pick and choose among those voices the ones that we find to be the most convenient from a policy perspective for our own purposes. Uh, instead, we should use, and well, we ought to use the anti-federalist writings to give the Constitution its fairest meaning and context that we possibly can. Thank you. Okay, we want to open it up for questions. Remember to use the mic. If you don't have questions, I got plenty. Yes. Thank you. Thomas Lane, Arizona State Chapter. I have a question directed at Professor Baker, but anyone can answer. Going back to your uh, reference of the progressive uh, use of terms in judicial review. Uh, there was a time when someone would enter your home or your country when they're not supposed to be there. They'd be an invader, and then it goes to criminal alien, illegal alien, illegal immigrant, immigrant, migrant. And this evolution of terms, what do we do to combat the regressive left's evolution of these terms? I'm sorry, I didn't hear or at least understand the actual question at the end. What do we do to combat the use of these terms? So you mentioned ju judicial Remar review. Regarding courts, is that what you're saying? In the context of anything that, whether it's the media, the left, when the truth is what you said about judicial review, besides kowtowing to what they said, what do we do to combat that use besides going at them? Hey, that's not what this is. What's, what's our strategy here? Well, it, it depends on the context. I mean, academics can write articles about it, and there are a lot of good articles written by professor members of the Federal Society. On Thayer, for instance, uh, I would suggest you read Calabrese and John McGinnis. Um, for lawyers, practicing lawyers, it depends on the context of the case. I mean, um, when you're talking to judges, you, you can't give them an academic lecture. You have to use the term judicial review, for instance. Uh, so I point to that as something that has, has directed our thinking. And people have the notion that necessarily everything that comes out of Congress must be, in fact, reviewed by the judiciary somehow. 
But one of the emphasis that Justice Scalia always made in the courses we taught together was on standing. And that is when you are strict about standing and case or controversy, uh, then it narrows the kinds of issues and the context in which they come before the court. This term, there will be a case in the Supreme Court from Louisiana involving abortion, but there's also a secondary issue raised by the state of Louisiana, and that is third party standing. So I think going in the context of litigation against particular kinds of things like uh, our colleague here did with the military courts is, is a very important thing to do. Wherever you can find those little issues and press it, and as you're building a record, you can bring in academic background, but again, ultimately, it's going to depend on the, the panel you're facing. <laughs> you give them the academic background, but you know, in many circuits, you don't know who the judges are until f a few days before you get up to argue. And then you have to be quick on your feet in order to be able to get the argument in a way that they will understand it. You know, it's, it's a long-winded answer to a short question. So I got a you know, short answer. I mean, you got to get to them when you're young. Uh, you got to explain. And in terms of terminology that works a groove in your mind, you've got to get your kids learning, you know, reading primary sources as early as possible. Uh, 13 years old is too late. Uh, uh, <laughs> you know, give your kids the Federalist Papers. I mean, really. I mean, these are, you know, a, a precocious eight-year-old can read these things. Uh, and they, they should. They they. I went through the state of Louisiana because at the time it was the only state that had a requirement on reading the Federalist Papers. And I was told by the Department of Education that uh, they couldn't assign them to high school because they couldn't read. No, they can't. They can't. I, mean, I mean, I can't give my law school to, these law students to, to, to read them. But I mean, you know, it's, it's in English, you know. And read Brutus, too. I mean, they're actually well written, except for Hamilton's. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm Adam Nicolai. I'm a sole practitioner in the LAX and South Bay area of Los Angeles. Um, I'm, a, I'm a history guy. I, I'm always interested in the historical background of things. So when we, when we talk about originalism um, as, you know, a, a theory for interpreting the Constitution and, and we look to the, to the original intent of the framers, I'm wondering if um, when, you know, when we when we're in the practice of law or in litigation and uh, there's, there's disagreement over a statute um, within you know, the context of a, a court battle and you know, sometimes a secondary or persuasive authority is, is to look at the legislative intent behind the, the statute uh, for meaning. I'm wondering uh, if, if any of you could shed light on uh, the historical context of that and was uh, looking to legislative intent or originalism, so to speak, behind a statute, was that an offspring or an offshoot of originalism in terms of the Constitution itself? Uh, I'm happy to answer that. Um, first of all, you said um, originalism as a theory. I'm just pointing out that I said it wasn't a theory. Uh, <laughs> Then you said original intention. Well, the originalism of Justice Scalia was original meaning, and he spent a long time writing about the weakness of original intention. It's not the same thing, and it's weaker. Legislative history, as he said in his book on uh, argument, um, even though he's against it, if you're an advocate and you're arguing to a court, you're going to have to use it if you've got judges on there who are going to look at it as a source. I mean, it's important to change the education. I absolutely agree with that. It's important to change the judges. And it's a, it's a process that will take a long time. And primarily the Federalist Society through education is going to be the force to continue to move. The, when you look back at way things were before the Federalist Society was founded, it is a sea change as everyone realizes who's been alive long enough.
Yeah, I mean, I mean Brutus uh, uh, 5, you know, the meaning and intent of the Constitution is to be collected from the words of it. Same thing that Hamilton says in 1791. At the same time, you know, they talk about context. So what? David Kaplan has some philosophy of language. Character of a word is a function from context to contents. So you have to know what the word is, but you know, the context, you could have some context sensitivity and knowing the legislative history might be part of that context sensitivity, but the object of interpretation is the meaning expressed by the text. And that's, that's I think, the cure to over-reliance on legislative history. You know, you know, read the debate, sure, but the thing you're interpreting is the text, the meaning expressed by the text in so, context. To follow up on that question, what's your position on whether the original intentions can help inform the meaning? Sure. Yeah. It, it, it's, I think that was, in part, the question. Yeah, what are you, what are you trying to do? Well, you know, that, that uh, uh, helps you know what you did, but you're not always successful. Uh, and you, you've, you've got to look at, at, at the words and what, you know, what, how other people understand them, what the, what the actual linguistic conventions are. You, people can be wrong about anything, including the, ex the existence of linguistic conventions. For ex post facto, there's a classic instance where they, uh, a bunch of people think ex post facto applies to, to civil stuff, but they, then they check out the Blackstone and they realize it doesn't. Well, I think you have to say more than just the text because it's structure and text, because the text is part of a certain structure, and that structure is separation of powers. And the fundamental disagreement between the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists was as to the nature of the structure, and in particular on separation of powers. The, and it, it, this is clear from the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists. They have a different idea. The Anti-Federalists pursued Montesquieu and what they interpreted Montesquieu to mean. The Federalists answered that, but it is clear from the critique by the Anti-Federalists that they said this was not a structure of separation of powers because the president had a veto power and therefore allowed him to interfere in the legislation. The power of, of judicial review which we think of as being the essence of Marbury is not the essence of Marbury. It is the different version of judicial review. What Jefferson was upset about in Marbury was not the claim that courts could review statutes. He was angry about the claim of the power to mandamus his secretary. That's what it was upset about. And this is all explained in the Federalist about why the Anti-Federalist version of separation of powers had not worked in the states. It was a theory that in practice didn't work because it ended up that the legislatures were dominant. They were supreme over the other two branches. 47. Right. Yes, in the back. Well, thank you. For Professor Baker, um, he spoke about the 17th Amendment, and I know this is off the topic of originalism, but what would the Anti-Federalists say about the 17th Amendment disenfranchising the states um, in the Washington power? What they would they hate it. Well, of course they would hate it, but, but so would the, the Federalists would hate it too. It was, it, it's all about balance. The Constitution, as originally drafted, is very complicated. It is a combination of horizontal separation of powers, vertical pitting of powers of the federal government against the states. Once you get the 17th Amendment, the states have fundamentally lost their power. Why? As the Federalist says in at least two places, the states are part of the federal government in the Senate. The Senate represents the states. Once they gave up their representation, and the movement for the 17th Amendment came from the states, the progressives convinced states that the Constitution was insufficiently democratic. The states gave up their power. And once they did that, the, the dynamic described in Federalist 51 of power against power between the states and the federal government, it was all over. Yes. Hi, my name is Catherine Urbanic. I'm a Pepperdine 2L. And um, 
my question is, uh, in terms of the anti-federalists being concerned about um, an infringement on rights, that a bill of rights would be too restricting because there were rights outside of it. And now, um, you know, as a young woman in law school, I'm hearing a lot about housing rights, or I read in the media about trans rights and trans kids' rights and women's rights and immigrants' rights, and it just seems like there is a ballooning of rights, and I wonder at what point, I guess, what, what is the Federalist response to, at what point does something, I guess it just seems like there's abundance of rights that I'm being told, and I'm kind of looking to the Constitution and not quite seeing it, and then being told it's under the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment of all of these rights, and so I'm just kind of, what is the Federalist response to that? Federalist 84, Bill of Rights would be dangerous. <laughs> yeah, it, it's a losing argument. I mean, this is Wilson's thing. Even if a Bill of Rights wouldn't, in fact, be dangerous, though, the way that the Constitution protects liberty is by separating power. So understanding 50, Federalist 51 better and the anthropology behind it, people abuse their power, they're self-aggrandizing. That's why you've got to have them bumping up against each other. Having a really accurate anthropology, I think, is really important. Understanding people are, you know, you're a Pepperdine, you should understand, you know, people are corrupt, <laughs> and they, uh, 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 when they get power, Wait, they get why worse. why Pepperdine? Right, uh, well, you know, well, that, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> Church of Christ teaches, teaches uh, uh, some uh, good doctrine about depravity of man. <laughs> they used to, anyway. And not only that, the, the anti-federalists didn't think that putting a Bill of Rights in really had legal binding effect. I mean, the Bill of Rights that they were talking about is heavily common law rights. And the federalists thought that common law applied to the Constitution. And you've got to go back and do the history on all of that. It's very confusing. Moreover, the, quote, rights that we're inventing are totally unrelated to common law rights. They're much more like European, in particular French rights. They're abstractions. They're not concrete. Common law rights are procedural. Last question. Yeah. Several of you have mentioned uh, legislative intent in the founding debate. Is that term the same as the contemporary use of the expression legislative intent, particularly in looking at legislative history? And if not, what's the origin of the contemporary term legislative intent? No, but I don't know. <laughs> well, if you've ever been involved in the Congress and see how it's run, it's, it's a way of doing an end run around the legislation. Congress deliberately creates ambiguous statutes, and whoever is controlling that particular house is bringing in witnesses and then developing a record not seen by those who vote on it. The, re the real problem is, as we know, most Americans realize after the vote on Ob Obamacare, is that members of Congress do not read what they vote on. And so they don't write it, they don't read it, and their staffs write legislative history, which courts in the New Deal and forward have resorted to in order to be able to change the statute to whatever they wanted it to be. Well, thank you all very much. Let's thank this great panel.